Good morning, kind people. It's like a balance between kindness and still being aggressive. It's, I'm trying to figure out that balance. I haven't got there yet. It's, it's been complicated for me. Uh, how's everybody doing in their kindness challenge? Good, bad? No one's doing it. Perfect. That's what you want to hear as a pastor. That's 40-day challenge. Perfect. Uh, so I, I've talked to a lot of people this week. It's been kind of interesting to hear, like, stories of kindness. For some people, some people, it's been so easy. Like, oh, this is my sweet spot. It's so, so overflowing. I'm just kind to everyone. And I've had all these circumstances where I could just be kind. And I'm like... I don't know about you, but for me, the last seven days have been difficult. It's like now that I'm aware of how unkind I can be, it's like God just like, I've been trying to tell you this for 20 years, man. Come on, pay attention. And I've just presented so many opportunities to choose kindness or unkindness, and I've become aware more often. I think some of my favorite conversations this week, one of them, I got a text message that said, "Uh, look, pastor, I'm just going to lock myself in my house for the next five weeks because this is the only way I can get through this kindness challenge. I was like, that's... I talked to my friends, some people that are in the, the, the customer service business, and one person was like, if I just don't kick them out of the store, like, that's a kind act, right? Like, if I, if I don't hang up the phone prematurely, that's a kind. Yeah, yeah that's kind. It's, we still got some time. We still got four weeks left. We can get a little farther down the road here. So I would just encourage you, um, whether you're starting this week or whether you started last week, like, don't get discouraged in this because this is a big deal. And we can trust that anytime we do something chasing and pursuing God, there will be resistance on the spiritual realm to prevent us from accomplishing that thing that God has called us to do. So know that you're going to face some adversary in this. Know that you're going to face challenge in this. Know that you're going to face difficulty, but it's worth pursuing, finishing the race that God has called us to, to demonstrate kindness in a way that changes everything about us and around us. So for for every week, we we want to kind of take a little bit more of a specific focus. Last week, we talked specifically, I gave you a challenge within a challenge to remove the negative comments and the criticism that's unnecessary from our vocabulary, and that was fun too. Anybody else have... Challenging opportunities to do that. Holy smokes, this is great. But I'm telling you, like, this is a big deal. And this week we want to, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag early. This week we want to take a specific focus as well. We want to be intentionally kind and find one person to go there. Like, we want to be over the top kind to one specific person. And I'll kind of give you the context of where this came from. So there's a, a study that was done a few years back, and that study became a book. And that book has actually been kind of influential in this series. Uh, the book is called um, The Kindness Challenge. It's a 30-day kindness challenge. We're better. <laughs> It's a 30-day kindness challenge where uh, they did some studying, they did some research, and challenged people for 30 days to be kind, incredibly kind to one specific person, ideally someone that they wished to improve the quality of the relationship with. Could be a spouse, could be a kid, could be a parent, could be a coworker, and just to really intentionally every day for 30 days to be kind, to demonstrate the kindness that God has shown them to the people, the, specifically the person that they did. And what they found in that study was after 30 days, interviewing both parties, 89% of the people said that there was a significant improvement in the quality of the relationship because of just the simple act of intentionally being kind. And that's my challenge for this week. For the remainder of the series, let's find someone, let's ask God to show us one person or maybe just looking around our home, our closest relationships, people that we work with, and who is the one person, not that we wouldn't neglect anybody else, but who's the one that we will go over the top to demonstrate authentic, genuine, loving kindness to them, specifically every day. And while that doesn't seem like an aha idea, I think maybe we could spend a little bit of time kind of digesting. Like it seems like we're already doing that. I feel like I'm already doing a good job of the people that I should be spending time with, spending the most time with, being intentionally kind to them, but we've said this for a few weeks now. The issue is typically not that we're not doing kind gestures, it's just that our unkindness has become oblivious to us and our unkindness is overpowering and overwhelming the the few kind things that we do. So our, our focus in this might need to be, okay, what do I need to undo as much as I need to do? And the reality is, like, that kind of boils down into a feeling that we have. We, we have a tendency to not do the right thing because we don't feel up to it. We don't feel that it's necessary. We don't feel like it's justified. We don't feel it'll make a difference. Like, it makes sense if you want a better marriage to just be kind to your spouse. But we know that. We learned that in kindergarten. Why aren't we doing that now? Because we just don't feel up to it. We said this last week. We talked about it for a moment, and we'll continue just every week to talk a little nugget about this because I think it's such a big deal when we realize the importance and value of kindness Oftentimes, we won't feel like being kind. Oftentimes, we won't feel like it's a right thing to do, a good thing to do. And we are great in human nature and following our feelings. Now, I'm not one of those guys that says, hey, your feelings are completely wrong all the time. I believe that God created feelings to improve and maybe even um, enhance experiences. But feelings were never designed to be our decision dictators. 
Feelings were given to us by God that things might be better, not that that would be the driver in what we do. And often it's because of our feelings that we choose to be unkind. I feel like revenge is a better option for me. I feel like holding this debt that you have towards me, this thing that you did to me, you need to pay me back for. I will hold this higher than doing the right thing. And here's where I think this gets super spiritual real quick. Often, I've heard this conversation lots of times, that why why would a, a good person choose to go to hell? And I don't think it's that people choose hell. I think it's that people choose the feeling that comes with sin. And because we choose the feelings that are accompanied with sin, we choose sin and the wages of sin is death, therefore resulting in eternal hell. Like, that's a big deal. And if we took a bigger picture and a bigger understanding of what sin really does, sin feels good for the most part in the moment. I heard a great analogy. Sin is a lot like a sneeze. It feels really good to do it. And then you're just left with a mess on your hands. I think that's where we live. We live in, we would pursue the feeling that comes along with sin, neglecting the severity of the wages of sin is death. And that same context is true when we think about why we are unkind to people, because feelings are generally our strongest driver in decision-making. So so my hope to you is to, to understand this, that our responsibility in following Jesus is to do the right thing and allow the feelings to catch up rather than allow the feeling to be the dictator of the direction that I go. And that's where discipline comes in. That's where doing the right thing comes in. That's where doing the right thing because it's the right thing. That's where doing the right thing and allowing the feeling to catch up rather than doing, we're never going to feel our way into the right decision. So how do we live in this life? How do we live in this discipline? How do we live through this responsibility to let the overflow of the goodness and the kindness of the gift of our God be displayed and demonstrated to all people around us? So specifically, like, how do we be most kind to the people close to us. Like today we're going to dissect a little bit about what kindness should look like in our homes. Maybe, maybe the people we're closest to, maybe our closest coworkers or closest friends. So let's just do a little quick poll. Uh, last week we did a little survey. It was internal. You made fun of me. It was great. I loved it so much. Um, if you were doing the spectrum of kind to unkind, maybe you could evaluate, or maybe your family could help you evaluate. Um, who are the people that get to see or experience more of your unpolished feelings than anyone else? Uh, Who are the people that get to see the more um, raw version of you than anyone else? Who are the people that you have the least amount of patience for? Starting to ring any bells. I see a lot of this going on right now. I'm just going to go ahead and warn you. Today, you need to protect your ribs, right? It's going to be rough. There's going to be a lot of this going on. So just be prepared. Um, and, And the reality is that's a little bit of a skewed response. Like the people you're closest to always get to see the worst version of you. That's a little bit of a skewed response. When, when Morgan, my oldest, um, was getting her driver's license, there was this video that they made him watch, and the video was like, I think trying to intimidate, put a little fear inside of the new drivers, like, most of the accidents you will ever be in happen within five miles of your home. Well, that's true, but most people don't drive farther than five miles from their home on an average day. Like, that's not really a, a valid number. But the, but the reality is true. Most of the accidents happens that close to home. It's the reality that people that see the worst of you are the per- people that you spend the most time with because you spend the most time with them. And I think the advantage and the disadvantage then falls into both categories. God specifically puts you into these circles with these people you would spend lots of time with, but also in that, sometimes they see the worst parts of us. So my focus for today is how do we demonstrate kindness to the people that are closest to us? Because the reality is like that can be difficult. In fact, I would ask you this specific question and this this big focus of how we're gonna do this is who is the person? that I will be kind to every day. I will be kind to this person every day. But that, that's a tough reality. Maybe it's a kid you have, maybe it's a, maybe a parent you have, maybe it's a coworker, maybe a classmate. Like who is the person that you are going to be kind with? And, and before we get all like, listen, pastor, I got this. Like you ask my wife, I am a kind person. You ask my kids, I am a kind. You ask my coworkers, I am a kind. Now again, protect your ribs because this is like that thing where we think we're being really kind because we do a couple kind things and we're oblivious to the unkindness that we offer. I always offer this in premarriage counseling. When you get married, when you say I do, you will think and you will feel that this is the most you can ever love someone. And then I'm always reminded, Katie and I have been married for 21 years and by the grace of God, I love her so much more today than I ever dreamed possible back then is what I always say to her. But the reality is I often reflect on the times where I've had to undo things that I did that could have brought us a whole lot closer together sooner. That I've had to work through some damage that I've caused 
because of unkind behaviors, because I failed to honor my spouse, because I failed to not do the thing that God taught me to do and lived in a selfish way, in a self-serving way, and it's done damage to our relationship. Yes, we are closer now and more in love now than we ever could have been or ever were back then, but it could be better if I would have just taken serious the instruction of God. So wherever you are, whether you're married, whether you're single, whether you've got some kiddos, some grandkiddos, or you're looking at your parents thinking, why don't you get this together? Wherever you are, close friends, coworkers, I believe that God can put someone on our heart, and maybe he's already begun to do that, that we can intentionally invest the overflow of the Holy Spirit to be supernaturally kind to them. And for the next 40 days, every single day, it's not to put aside the other challenges and put aside everybody else. I don't have to be kind to you. I don't have to be kind to you. I don't have to be... No, it's to be kind to them specifically in addition to every other person. And I'm going to go out on a limb before we get all like, no, that's not really me, and just, and just suggest this. Whether it's bad and you want it to be good, whether it's good and you want it to be better, I, I would imagine that maybe we have some blind spots when it comes to our unkindness, specifically with the people that we're closest to. And if you're not prepared to have that full, honest conversation yet, where you ask? Every now and then I'll ask my wife questions I wish I wouldn't have asked. And she'll tell me very thoroughly where I've missed the mark. But it's necessary. And if you're not ready for that yet, then I would say just prepare yourself. But I would imagine to start praying now and ask God to reveal to you where has unkindness started to cloud up some relationships that ought to be very close and endearing in your life. Where has unkindness maybe stirred up some resentment between you and a coworker where it's causing friction or maybe even unhealthiness in your work environment? And what if you could specifically concentrate for the next four or five weeks to be kind to this person? I will be kind to them every day. Last week we said this, and I believe it to be really true. Kindness often gets abandoned at the doorway of vagueness. Like kindness seems like an incredible idea. So vast, so large, so big, intimidating to begin. Where do I start? How do I put application to this? How do I get specific in this? And my hope today is that we start to dig into the real-time application of how we can be kind specifically to someone who needs our kindness to be seen, to take the vague and make it real, to take the intangible, to make the dreamland into real work that God has done in us and then through us. And that's my hope that's my challenge as we start to unpack today because I think, I think we have a tendency to not be kind to the people we're closest to. Maybe a better way to say it is we, we aren't kinder than necessary to the people that we're most comfortable with. In fact, I think that's an issue. The, most two, common, the, the two most common scenarios, the two most frequent scenarios where we demonstrate unkindness are where we're in conflict and where we're in comfort. In, kind, in conflict, we get it. Like if we're in conflict with someone, if they've rubbed us the wrong way, they've irritated us at work, they just keep stepping on our toes at home, like we get it. You get an argument with your spouse, you get an argument with your parent, what do we do? We start out attempting to be kind and, and to get our point across, but if we start to, to pick up that we're not getting our point across, we start to pick up that, they're not, that maybe they're winning the argument, what do we do? We resort back to past hurts. We, we resort back to past arguments. We re- resort back to past times they let us down and we, we, we can cock this big chicken pot pie of an argument and then we dump it on them because we want to win the argument. Like we get that. Like it's easy to be unkind in conflict, but I think we overlook the fact that we are often unkind in our areas and relationships of comfort. That we often take for granted the people that God has put specifically in our lives to be closest to. We, we start to forget your feelings because I feel like I'm unjustified. I feel like I've been wronged. I feel like I've been hurt. And I will do all that I can to make sure that you are aware of the unkindness you've given me. And in turn, give unkindness back to you. But why are we so unkind to the people we're most comfortable with? Why are we so unintentionally unkind to the people we're most comfortable with? With. I think a lot of it happens just like most wrecks happen within five miles of the house. It's just the people we spend time with and by default, they're going to see us exhausted. They're going to see us tired. They're going to see us worn out. But that isn't a valid excuse to be unkind to the people that we ought to be loving. And, and I think the reality is we think that God has just shortchanged us somehow. Like the Holy Spirit has given us enough power to be kind publicly, but not quite enough to be kind privately. And the reality is our God is a big God, a great God who has loved us in our bad times, in our tough times, in our worn out times. And he asks us to reflect his love, his grace, his kindness, his goodness to the people around us, including and maybe even specifically including the people closest to us. So how then do we demonstrate this? Paul, one of the writers, one of the church planners in the New Testament, we write so much of the letters that Paul wrote to instruct and encourage and correct the church in the first generation. Paul gives what I believe is a really powerful instruction and illustration and example of what it looks like to to not live as the world does and follow their feelings. I mean, it's the same challenges Paul addressed back then that still exists today. To not be guided and dictated by our feelings, but to know the truth 
and to follow the example of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is one of my favorite chunks of Scripture in all the New Testament. If you want to follow along, you can. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, If I could speak all the languages of the earth and of the angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I, add, if I had the gift of prophecy and I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but I didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I had to the poor, even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would gain nothing. If you've been to church before, like this isn't new information. God loves us, so our response is to love him and to love others. Like that's, that's simple, that's plain, that's feeling, but Paul really gets into the, to the meat of this concept of love is not just a feeling. Like not, love is not something you can fall into and fall out of. L- love is not just this biological connection between mother and child, father and child, child and parent. Like love is so much more than that. Love is more action than feeling. L- love is surrendering to the guidance of the Holy Spirit, not just doing what I feel like doing. And then Paul continues on in verse four, and he says it like this. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous, boastful, proud, or rude. Love does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. Love is always 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 hopeful and it endures through every circumstance. I love this passage. I think I was trying to do the count this week. I think I'm right around 40 weddings that I've been able to lead in, in my years of ministry. And in those 40 weddings, I'm almost positive I've used this passage in every single ceremony. And I think, I wish, I think we could read this in a theoretical way, but I wish we could read it in an application way. Paul gets so specific in here. And he says that love is patient. Not that love tries to have some patience from time to time. Like love is patient on mistake one, two, and three, but by the time you get to number four, you have full excuse not to be loving anymore. Love is not rude. Yeah, but if they was rude first, then that's excuse. No, Paul says love is. Not that love maybe sometimes tries. But that it does. Love is. Love does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. Love keeps no records of wrong or being wronged. What's a marriage advice today? Let's just camp out in verse 4 for a little bit. Let's let go of some being wrong. Let's let go of some being rude. Let's let go of some of these things that are so unkind. Love is a big deal. But not just in theory. Love is a big deal in application and how we live and how we display kindness. I heard this a couple weeks ago. I thought this was a great illustration. It's in your notes. Kindness is love wearing work boots. Kindness is only kindness when we put it in motion. Kindness is only kindness when it's an action of the love overflowing from us. Kindness is an overflow of the Holy Spirit. It's not just theoretical. It's a responsive demonstration of the love that God has shown me that I pay forward to God and to everyone that I come in contact with. So how do we live this love out? I have three points I want to talk about today, three things I took out of the scripture and I think are incredibly powerful. If we would just start to allow the Holy Spirit to move here, number one, if you're taking notes, position myself to love. Position myself to love. Now, that seems like I'm taking a lot of responsibility myself, and I'm not. It's only because God loves me that I can do this. But often, our kindness and our unkindness is revealed when we're pressurized. It's not that the thing that causes the pressure causes me to be unkind or to be kind. Like oftentimes the argument I have with my kids is, why did you do that? Because she did this. No, she doing that and did not make you do this. You chose to do this. The pressure revealed the position of your heart. The pressure revealed whether you were postured in kindness, whether you were overflowing in kindness, or the pressure revealed that you wasn't. And because of that, the unkindness is what overflowed. The unkindness is what is seen. The unkindness is what is demonstrated because the pressure revealed where you were. I will never be able to respond with the patience that God has shown me if I'm, my heart is not positioned to love. I can never let go of being wronged if my heart is not saturated in the love of God. As a follower of Jesus, Jesus promises that he would send us a helper, an advocate, the Holy Spirit, the personal presence of God to go with us, to be with us, and to help guide us. And because God has given us his Holy Spirit, Scripture teaches us that the way we recognize how the Holy Spirit is working within us is by the fruit that it produces. And the fruit requires kindness. The evidence that God is working in us, alive and active through us, presents, reveals itself one of the ways in kindness. And here's the thing. I believe that as a Christian, you you can have received the Holy Spirit 
but then shut the Holy Spirit down from overflowing in the ways and the fruits of the Spirit. That we can limit God from having access to all the components of us, of our being, to be able to overflow in the fruit of the Spirit. Last week we talked about being clothed in kindness. I can have a closet full of clothes that do me no good if I don't put them on. I can be filled with the Holy Spirit, but if I shut it down because of my attitude, because of the position of my heart, because of the hardness of my heart, and it doesn't get demonstrated or displayed to the people around me, I'm just shutting down the Holy Spirit. My responsibility is surrender to his guidance, to his love, to his grace. And if I allow the Holy Spirit to have the space required to transform my heart, the overflow flows naturally. I don't have to work for it. I just live in a place where I'm following the promptings and the nudgings and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And kindness is no longer a challenge. It's an overflow. My human nature is to live very selfish, selfishly. And my spirit nature, when following the obedience in the Holy Spirit, is to live selflessly. I will produce myself. I will produce the fruit of being selfish. And following the guidance and the overflow of the Holy Spirit, I will produce a selfless life. So I position my heart to love. How do we do that? One of, the, one of the greatest reasons God gives us the scriptures is that we might fill up on his truth, his knowledge, his wisdom, his life-changing transformation so that when we are pressurized, when we are squeezed, that which was inside of me is going to come out. And when I'm filled up on the word of God and I become pressurized and squeezed, what would you expect to come out, right? I get so frustrated sometimes with longtime Christians who will say things like, well, I just can't figure this out on a day-to-day. And I'll remind them, what are you doing to fill up with? If you're filling up with streaming TV shows and you're filling up with all the social media and you're filling up with all the negativity in our world and then you wonder why you don't respond like Jesus wondered. Like like so much of what we read about in the Bible is to learn and specifically study portions and parts of the scriptures. But so much of what we read about in the Bible is just that we may stay filled with God's word so that when we're squeezed and pressurized, the overflow is what is inside of us reflects our God. Whatever you fill up with is what you will pour out when squeezed upon. So we stay in the word and we spend time listening to God and we spend time perfecting, following the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And we take time to respond. I think maybe one of the most useful things I could give to parents when it comes to how to best be kind to your kiddos is to take time to respond. We live in a world where everything is just happening, happening, happening. Everybody wants decisions and actions right now. And then we get home and we're exhausted, we're tired, we're burned out, and we're comfortable. And when our kids press our buttons, what do we do? We respond immediately, which sometimes is responding in feelings. And feelings never lead to right decisions. Right decisions lead to right feelings. And when we respond based on how we feel in the moment, what do we do? You need to be quiet. I'm tired of the questions. You need to stop changing the channel when I'm watching the TV. No, just me? Okay. Okay. Maybe the most spiritual thing we can do in responding to the people closest to us is to take them some time to allow my feelings to settle. That the real overflow is what God's been doing on the inside of me. That the real overflow is the kindness that God showed. Not the raw emotion of how I feel in the moment, but to take time to pause. Maybe some of us adults need some timeouts. Not a nap. I didn't say a nap. I said a timeout. There's a difference. To respond in love. To respond with patience to pause the conversation so I'm not responding out of frustration, but I'm responding out of the overflow of the work the Holy Spirit has done in me. In a different letter that Paul would write to a different group, a different gathering, but still very applicable to us today and all Christians, in Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, Paul writes in chapter 6, and he gives instructions to the church. And in a portion of Ephesians 6, he gets very specific to the instruction to the family. And he jumps right into this, and he starts speaking to the kiddos. And he says, obey your mom and dad. Honor your mom and dad. And and teenagers, if I could just speak to you for a minute. Your mom and dad, they like that verse. It can seem very self-serving. And that may be the only people you've ever heard it from, but can I just assure you that Jesus said these words? Because there is value and importance in honoring and obeying your mom and dad. Not to get you to follow the rules, but to bring yourself in alignment with what God is doing in you and through you. And you might be finding some real frustration in your faith advancement because you're just missing the mark when it comes to honoring, obeying mom and dad. And that's not to put you down. That's not to make you feel bad. That's just to get you to understand there is true kingdom power in honor and obeying your parents. That it brings you into an alignment where you can see God and hear God more clearly. Don't miss out on what God is trying to do in you as a young person because you you don't want to do what God's called you to do. You want to do what everybody else tells you is the right thing to do. You want to do what you see everybody else doing and act on your feelings and act on your entitlement versus acting on what God has instructed. Now, parents, Paul didn't stop with honor and obey your mom and dad. 
Verse 4, he says this, fathers, and you could put mothers right in this category. Parents, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Maybe a paraphrase of that would be, parents, don't provoke your kids to get more angry by the way you treat them. In those moments where we get so frustrated with the action, the behavior, the failure to obey or the failure to honor, and we want to respond in a way, and all we do is just pour gasoline on the fire. Parents, if you need to take a time out, take a time out. I understand that sometimes it can be frustrating when you're telling your preteen or your teen to do the same thing over and over again. How many times must I tell you to fold your socks? But the reality is your frustration only makes them more angry. And, and rules without relationship, without a healthy relationship, will only lead to rebellion. And if you just keep pushing rules and rules and do what I say, do what I say, do what I say, you're going to drive your kids farther from you and farther from faith than you can imagine. Take time. Be patient. Be loving. Number two, don't take people for granted. The easiest people to take for granted in our lives are the people that we're most comfortable with. And the moment we start to take someone for granted internally, we start to become unkind to them externally. The moment we start to take someone for granted internally, we start moving towards unkindness externally. We got to get better at recognizing how we take people for granted because our taking them for granted leads to so many things that are just unhealthy in our relationships. In a different letter to a different congregation, Paul writes to the church in Rome, Romans chapter 12, and he gives us this, this reminder of the things that Jesus showed us. He says, verse 10, he says, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring one another. Now, let's just break that down for a minute. What would it look like, parents? to love your kiddos with general, general, genuine affection, like, like personalized affection, like affect, affection that's directed specifically toward them. I've got four kids, and it's really easy to love all four kids the same way, but it's not very genuine and it's not very effective. All four of my kids are so different, and the more I've gotten to know them, the, the more intricate they are and the more detailed they are and the more this word may mean so much to this kid and it may mean the opposite to this kid. What's it look like to love your parents with genuine affection? What's it look like to love your coworker, that one that rubs you the wrong way? What's it look like to maybe shift the way that we love them with genuine affection and taking delight to enjoy, to enjoy it, not to endure it, to, to find satisfaction in it, not to find frustration in it, to, to find delight in honoring one another, taking delight in honoring your mom and dad, finding joy in honoring your spouse, not finding duty and responsibility in it, but to take joy in honoring your spouse and your kids and your coworkers, to find joy in honoring your boss. But one of the most probably effective books that I've read in all my years of ministry was a book called Five Love Languages. If you've never read it, it's a great book. If you haven't read it in a while, read it again. One of the most powerful things it showed me was that I have a tendency to love people the way that I best receive love or feeling loved. And, and just because that's the language that I best interpret doesn't mean that that's interpreted and understood by everybody else around me. And I've spent so many of my years and my days and my weeks trying to love people in a way that they couldn't receive it. My responsibility as a mature believer is to identify how I can genuinely love, how I can genuinely demonstrate affection, how I can uniquely and personally love you in a way that you can understand. And I believe that honor is a very similar concept, that how I honor my wife is very unique to my wife. And how I honor my oldest and my middle two and my youngest are very specific and unique to how they have been built and created. That doesn't mean it's always going to be that way, but that means my responsibility as a parent, my responsibility as a coworker and the people that I work close to, my responsibility as a boss is to understand the people that I'm surrounded by that I might intentionally and clearly demonstrate honor to them. Wives, if I could just talk to you for a minute, one of the core foundations that every man has is to feel honored to feel honored at home, to feel honored by our family, to feel honored at work. And some of the things you may be doing with the best intentions are coming off dishonoring to your husband. And it's driving a wedge between the two of you. And I'm not trying to do this in a self-serving manner where we're just gonna do things, crazy things to honor our husbands, but can I just plead with you for a minute? Katie and I had this conversation right after we got married and it was an eye-opening one for me because I didn't know it was a need that I have and because of that, it was, well, didn't know it was a need that she could help me to understand. And being an honoring wife makes all the difference in the world when it comes to how your marriage continues to grow. Honor up, honor down, honor sideways, honoring our parents, honoring our spouses. Honor is a huge deal in the kingdom of God. In fact, Mark tells us of this story, Mark chapter 6, where Jesus had been gone in the mission field, and he comes back to his hometown, he comes back to Nazareth, and he goes back into the mode that like he usually does. He's teaching, he's imparting wisdom, he's performing miracles, and then he hits a lid. 
And this has never happened before. Jesus has never come to a place where he's like, hey, these people aren't receiving the thing that I'm trying to give them. They're not receiving the miracles that I'm wishing to give them. And Mark unpacks it for us. Jesus says that they started to scoff at him. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't this the son of Mary, the brother of James and the brothers? And Jesus gives us this this clear statement. He says that the people, that the locals, that his relatives and family, they were unable to receive that which Jesus was trying to give. They didn't receive the power that Jesus was trying to impart. Why? Because they would not honor him. He's just a local. He's just a family member. There are people in your family and you are are suppressing the growth in their life because we don't want to. There are people in our, co- in, our, in our work environment, there are people in our friend groups, and we've been frustrated with them, we've been irritated by them, and our failure to honor them is doing damage in our relationship. And I would encourage you, what's it look like to err on the side of honor? To assume that you don't know the whole story, that there's more in there to the truth, and I will err on the side of I will honor you anyway. For the 40 days, for the remainder of the 40 days, what's it look like for this one particular person that God places on your heart to truly honor them. That's why we said last week, we're not going to talk negatively. We're not going to do unnecessary criticism towards someone. Why? Because negative talk is dishonoring. And negative talk will create this this fog in our relationship web. In our minds, the way God created them, they're so fascinating. We're We're learning so much more about them all the time. The way that God created our mind, the more we obsess about something, think about something, the more intricate the web gets woven together. The more we think about it, it's such a good thing. It's why we, we talk about so many ways to, to know more of God and know more about God. It's why we read the Bible and do our devotion on our own. It's why we come and listen to people that preach from the Bible. It's why we sing songs that have so much understanding and present so much understanding of the scriptures. It's why we, we gather together in a small group and we discuss the truth that God has shown us. When we, we weave all these together, it becomes this, this, this growing being, this growing life that comes from knowing. But when we err on the side of negativity and unnecessary criticism, we're doing the same concept except for it's a toxin spreading to our mind instead. And those, those things where society would say, hey, it's okay to vent about them to someone. What you're really doing is this blowing up this unhealthiness in your thought life. When society would say, like, it's okay to talk about them, let me just say this. If you're going to talk about someone without first going to talk to them, there's something we got to work out. First, we have to be willing. The kind thing to do is to go and talk to someone before we ever go around and we talk about them. You can't be tearing people down. It blows us up. Can I just get real specific for a minute? Spouses, stop talking to your coworkers about how bad your spouse is. Coworkers, stop talking to your coworkers about how bad your coworkers are or your boss is. Parents, stop talking to Facebook about how bad your kid is. It's tough. I told you, ribs are going to get sore today. But the reality is, every time we go down this path of negativity and unnecessary criticism, we're dishonoring the people that God has intentionally placed closely in our life. If we want to rebuild, restore, build up healthy relationships, it's time to demonstrate kindness. It's time to be kind in our words, be kind in honoring, be kind in how we do this, to position myself to love better and to not take people for granted, but to honor them the way God has honored and shown us to honor. Number three, be love. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to speed this up a little bit. I'm not going to use all the words. I'll just be love. I said what I said, be love. It sounds weird. It sounds strange, right? Like last week we talked about like the problem most people have with kindness is that they think they're being kind, but they're unaware of the unkindness that they have. Uh, I can be loving. I can, I can be loving, I can do loving gestures, but the problem is if my concentration is just to do some loving gestures, then the unloving things that I do will often overshadow the loving things that I attempt to do. Oftentimes it's the unloving things that I do that drive a wedge between the best relationships. Maybe another way to say it is, often it's the things of indifference that I do that drive a wedge between loving relationships. See, I believe that the hate can be opposite of love, but also indifference is the, the opposite of love. And there, there may be people in your home who feel really indifferent to you. Dad, come look at this. Whatever. I will want to get time. Mom, can you come help me with this? Yeah, when I have time. I'm busy now. And your intention wasn't to be unloving, but that indifference was interpreted in that coworker who thinks you ignore him all the time. They don't care about me. No, I just, I don't want to say something mean. That's great. That's good self-awareness. But maybe our responsibility isn't just to withdraw the unkind thing, but to press in and lean into how we can demonstrate kindness to them. Indifference can be interpreted as unkind, as unloving. Love isn't confined just to a feeling. Love is a posture of our heart. Love is an action. Love is a verb. No, no one? Okay. 
And I love the structure that Paul uses to define love for us. 1 Corinthians 13, we read it earlier. Love is patient and kind. It's not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable and it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice in injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. And then later, this guy, John. John was one of Jesus' closest disciples. John was the longest living of the disciples. John outlived all the rest of them. And John would write so much about what he saw and experienced with Jesus, but also about so much of how we can better understand who God is. And I love the explanation that John gives of God in John, 1 John chapter 4. Starting in verse 7, he says, Dear friends, brothers and sisters, fellow believers, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God. For God is love. The phrasing, there's that phrasing. Not that God is loving, not that God does loving things, not that God demonstrates loveness from time to time, but God is love. Verse 9, God showed me how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. God isn't just loving, God is love. God doesn't just do loving gestures, God is love. It's not that God has loved before, it's that God is love. Okay, okay. So my job as a follower of Jesus, knowing that God loved so much, that God is love, that he sent his one and only son to die, that I might have eternal life through him, my job is to reflect my God through what I do, through how I live, to reflect the character of God to everyone I come eyeball to eyeball with because God loved me so much, and if God is love, then I ought to be love. Not that I do loving things, not that I have a loving tendency, not that I've loved in the past, not that I follow the feeling of love, but I allow the principle, the action, the verb of love. My responsibility is to reflect God to all the people that I see to be loved. So when we do that, what if we were to take 1 Corinthians and make it personal? 1 Corinthians 13, what if, what if this becomes the filter through how I demonstrate kindness? What if this becomes the, the framework that I put on my refrigerator? And as a family, this is who I am as a child of God, walking to follow Jesus, living out my faith. This is the litmus test of the response of my heart that I am patient and I am kind and I am not jealous or boastful or proud or rude and I do not demand my own way. I am not irritable and I keep no record of being wrong. I do not rejoice about injustice, but I rejoice whenever truth wins out. And my love never gives up, it never loses faith. It is always hopeful and it endures through every circumstance. So who is the person in your life that you need to love like that? Who is the person, the family member, the coworker, the friend that you need to be love? But who's the person that God has nudged you? Maybe we've been talking about this for a while. Maybe there is somebody in your circle that God keeps presenting opportunities and opening doors that you might share your faith with them. And I promise you, kindness softens hearts and kindness opens ears and kindness tears down walls of, re of resistance and kindness presents opportunities for someone to hear the truth of Jesus Christ. And your responsibility in this kindness series may not just be to be kind in general, to be kind in vagueness, but there is one person that God has put in your life, I promise, and maybe even more, that if you could demonstrate intentionally what it looks like to be love, it would change the way they see God. It would change the way they see church. It would change the way they see Christians. You have an opportunity. I have an opportunity. I will be kind every day. I will be kind every day. I will be kind on the easy days and I will be kind when it's difficult. I will be kind on the days where it just happens smoothly and I'll be kind on the days where I have to go intentional. I will be kind on the days where they get all in my face and I get pressurized and I will be kind on the days where it's just a warm embrace, where it's just spending time, where it's just an encouraging word. You have the power because of the Holy Spirit working in you to go and to change our approach to what it is to be kind, to be love and to honor one another. So let's go do it. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, I thank you. God, I thank you that you are love. God, that there is no question in the times where I don't deserve it. God, it's not that you've stopped being loving because you are love. 
God, I thank you for the times where you just show up out of the blue and remind me that you are love. That you loved me so much to send your only son to die that I might know you for eternity. God, you are love. God, as we leave today in our greetings, in our conversations, in our handshakes, as we go to lunch, as we sit down and we gather with the people closest to us, God, I know that so many of those relationships are strained and under pressure on a constant basis. And God, I know that you've given us keys to see health in our relationships. So allow us, move us, prompt us, strengthen us to just be kind. In Jesus' name.